East End, you had to play a guitar, you play football, or you box, or you rob a bank. We grew up in, um, in streets where there was um, one house on its own, and then there'll be bond houses along the road, and then there'll be a few more. There'll be gaps. You had two families living in one small place with an outside toilet. So you'd go out to the back and walk out into the toilet at the back. Um, there was no heating, so it was, it was pretty poor, pretty rough, and uh, it gave the East End its, its name of being good, good people, a very close community. Um, there was a lot of unemployment, but the people that did work, like my granddad and my parents worked in the docks, they worked doing anything, any manual work, because that's what they were used to. As you get older, you play football for your school, you kick a ball, you play cricket. The sport was very, very serious in the East End of London, the same as boxing. Unfortunately, there are still people in the East End of London that decide to support teams like Arsenal and Tottenham. Uh, I don't understand that, but you can't make people support a team. But I, I was taken to Upton Park at a very, very young age. I think I was about three or four. And in the North Bank, in the terraces, there was all standing and you just had this iron bar that went across that the grown-ups used to put their arms on and rest while they watched the game. Well, I can remember sitting on this iron bar with me dad, holding me round, so, because it was quite packed. Steve Harris texted me uh, when West Ham were going for a really bad patch. Um, my children are all West Ham fans, and so is his children. And uh, he texted me and he said, do you realise we've put our children through a lifetime of misery <laughs> because we make them, we've, we've, we've got them to support West Ham. So they will go through the same stress, heart attack material that I've gone through for 60 odd years, so, yeah. Basically, in the East End, you had the Cockney Rejects, who were mad West Ham fans, and you had RDB, which was Remus Down Boulevard, we're mad West Ham fans. And at the time, RDB, in the late 70s, was signed to Quarry Management, which was status quo. So basically, we jumped up the ladder uh, and left the other bands behind and went on tour with status quo. And we were all over Europe, Scandinavia, for months. When we come back from them tours, it was then that we started feeling the pinch when it comes to record companies and independent record labels opening and punk bands being signed. So I hate punk, but it give people a big opportunity, it give bands that no one would listen to, it give them a chance to record something, whether they made any money out of these indie independent record cut labels, I don't know, but it give musicians, probably some of them that couldn't really play very well, it give them a chance to, for a bit of stardom. But at the same time, it still ruined the good bands that have been working for the last five or six years, building up a fan base. Punk was moving around and, and pushing other bands out of the way. Luckily for Maiden, um, Steve had kept Maiden working through the late 70s and building up a fan base, not only in London, but all over England, like Middlesbrough, Manchester, Newcastle, Birmingham. So Maiden already had quite a huge fan base around about 1977, 78. And then um, and joining them in 79, just, you know, it just, you just realise how big the fan base was, you know. But punk did ruin quite a few bands, yeah. <laughs> Remember uh, back in around about 74, 75, um, I was playing with Remus Down Boulevard, RDB, 
at the Bridge House in Canyon Town. That we were resident there. And I always remember this guy with long black hair with a leather jacket coming in the pub with a West Ham scarf on. And later I found out it, it, it was Steve. He used to come and watch us play. So, it, it, you know, the, the West Ham bond has always been there and it still is, you know. And when I first went and met Steve and Dave Murray uh, at Wardour Street, they gave me a copy of a cassette of some songs on it and I went home. But you've got to remember that in them days, when they were, before they recorded the first album, um, they'd never worked with harmony guitars. So it gave me a big opportunity to, to walk into this band and take these songs home and then work on them like Phantom of the Opera, uh, Iron Maiden, Running Free with all the harmony guitar fills. It gave me a, a, an opportunity to open up the songs, making them bigger, making them more excitable, uh, just bigger, you know, wider sound. And so then I didn't find it hard learning them. I, I quite enjoy sitting at home sort of working on different things, but it, it put the harmony guitar sound into them songs that had never had harmony guitars before. For us to headline any gig, we have to play for about an hour and 20 minutes. So basically, our set consisted of the first two albums. So in our set in 1979 was Rothschild, was Killers, was certain songs that were left for the second album. So we were already doing the first and second album live, not every song, but most of it, to build the set out, to make the set last longer. So when we went in to record the first album, we did it very quickly, and then straight out with the Judas Priest tour. Then we did Top of the Pops, then we went out with Kiss. But while we were, while we were working with Kiss, we didn't have to do such a big set, because the set was cut down because we were supporting. So we already had, I was already pre-production for Killers, I was already working on the guitar parts because I thought I'd be recording the album. And um, it was on the Kiss tour that, that Rod Smallwood decided that I was listening to certain songs, certain music that I enjoy listening to in my own private hotel room, in my own Sony Walkman. Um, and he took it upon himself to start saying to me that because I was listening to this music that I wasn't totally into Iron Maiden. When I was getting home, he was, make, he was making sure that I couldn't go home to see the, me wife and kid because he'd have other things booked and it slowly became this big problem of Rod telling me how to lead, live my life. And I'm, I'm not that sort of person. So, so that was how we ended up started drifting apart. With Maiden, it was more of a business. It was a, um, this Rod Smallwood got it into his head that you had to keep the whole band together. And it was on the Kiss tour that I decided to travel with the crew for a couple of days in the lot, just have a laugh with the crew, just have a break. I didn't want to sit in a coach in a minibus with the band. They took it as if I didn't want to travel with them, but it's not that. It's just you need a break from being with together 24 hours a day. Otherwise, everyone starts arguing. I think Steve, Steve and Rod have a big partnership. Don't get me wrong, Steve. It's always been Steve's band. Steve has all been already always been the governor. And without Rod Smallwood, Iron Maiden still would have made it big. It, it, Rod Smallwood didn't make Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden made Iron Maiden.
would have liked to have thought if we if we hadn't have had such a problem with CBS Records in Los Angeles and New York, Lionheart would have been great because myself, Steve Mann and Rocky all got on like I did with RDB. Prayer Mantis, we, me, Tino and Chris, again, it's like three brothers, the three musketeers. It's like that all the time. And with Mantis, the lovely thing about that was that we had our own studio and for all the six or seven or eight albums we did, myself, Tino and Chris used to sit together in the studio, drum machine, guitars, piano, keyboard, and we'd put everything down and then we'd get the drummer in and then we'd get the singer in. So it was basically our little world, you know, and it worked really well. And it was only the fact that um, after 15 years, when the record company in Tokyo closed down their um, rock metal department, that Mantis was the first time in 15 years that we never had a record deal. So, and, and I said to Tino and Chris, well, like, what are we going to do? And then Pony Canyon brought out the great... The best, the best of Prayer Mantis. So they didn't need us recording any more songs because they had all the best of on all the other albums. So basically we sort of drifted apart because we didn't have a record company. Um, and Tino, I, I went to Italy to work with the Clairvoyance and some other bands in, in London. I went to America to work with Al Atkins. Tino and Chris just left Mantis to just drift away. And it was only been the last few years that they've got got back together again to start recording again through Frontiers. So, you know, everyone has a little bit of a rest, you know. I've been asked many, many times, please write a book. Because from the experience of growing up in the East End, playing football, working in the docks as an engineer, going, going on tour with Quo, Maiden, 15 years with Mantis, America with Lionheart, they've wanted me to do this book for years. But a title, I've never, ever really thought about it. I think it would have to be something like, I can't believe I'm still alive, or I can't believe I'm still here, or something, something to, in that vein to say, I'm lucky that I've, I've done what I've done and I'm still doing it, or I'm still here, you know, that sort of thing, you know.